Why don't we start with the story of how you got the Medal of Honor? Hmm. Well, I think I've told that so many times <laughs> that I, and um, my wife's not here to keep me on track. Uh, I guess she'll usually say, get to the point, Gary, get to the point. Like already, I'm not even to the point. <laughs> uh, but I, I guess for the purpose of just giving people a, a brief explanation, uh, I was a Special Forces uh, member of an A team in Vietnam. We worked with a group of people called Mountain Yards. And our, our job was to uh, live with them, become part of the culture, develop friendships with them, uh, and whatever way we could, just um, establish a relationship with them that would be beneficial, uh, not only to them, so we could teach them some of the things that we, uh, on the team, like medicine, weapons, those kinds of things, we wanted to teach them. Uh, but we also wanted to learn from them too, because they lived in the jungle, uh, this was their culture. And so I developed an attitude of uh, uh, going in there as a student, which actually is one of the things that Special Forces instills in you. Um, we're definitely not the ugly American kind of person. You go in with a, an idea of, I want to become a student. If I can develop that kind of relationship with you, it will be easier for you to accept the things that I would like to share with you. So I was a medic with this team. You know, I say all that to, to, to emphasize that there developed a tremendous love between those of us who served with the Mountain Yards and the Mountain Yards themselves. It was a tremendous, tremendous love. Uh, we became part of their culture. Um, so much so that uh, most of the time I'll say that my war was not, because people ask me, how did I feel about the war? I said, my war was not Henry Kissinger, Nixon, or Johnson's war. My war was with the Mountain Yards there in the jungle. What I did there, I did for the love that I had for them and the love that they had for me, and I would do it again. So I never really felt any, felt any guilt or animosity or regret about whatever I did in the war. Um, but that friendship uh, was key to the Medal of Honor action. Um, our camp came under sea. We were in the, in the highlands, in the jungles. We were about, a, about a, uh, maybe a mile and a half, two miles from the Laotian border. And our camp came under siege. We were surrounded for over 30 days by over 10,000 uh, of the enemy. And very quickly within the battle, I was shot uh, the first time um, fragments from a, a rocket hit my spine and knocked out my spinal cord so, so that I was paralyzed, I couldn't walk. Uh, one of my mountain yard friends, my bodyguard, who was a 15-year-old, uh, actually, uh, because we had made a, 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 a vow to each other to always be there for each other, he found me in the midst of that battle, saw that I was wounded, and picked me up and carried me. So everything that I did, I didn't do without his help. His name was Dale. He was a 15-year-old. He carried me throughout the battle as we continued to fight, um, rescue certain people that were wounded, bring them down, take care of them. One was a, an American officer. Uh, we brought them down into the medical bunker, started to treat them, and then once we, they were stabilized, we I had. Dale picked me up and carried me back out into the battle. I got shot a second time in the side, and then uh, Dale brought me back down. Um, the other medic on the team thought it was very serious. He said, you know, you need to stay here. And I said, if I'm going to die, I'm not going to die down here. I'm going to die in the battle. So Dale, take me back out into the battle. So he ca carried me back out into the battle. He got shot in the leg, so he couldn't carry me anymore, so he was dragging me. I got shot in the stomach. Um, he w wouldn't take me down because I insisted we stay out there and, and continue to fight. By this time, they had, uh, two of my other mountain yards had put me on a litter, and they were carrying me around on a litter so we could continue to fight and help others take care of them, give them wounds, encourage the others that are fighting. And then Dale heard a, a rocket coming in he rolled me over and laid on top of me, and he was killed, protecting me. Um, two of my other medics, Mountain Yard medics, then picked me up, and they continued to carry me around and, as we continued to fight uh, until I finally collapsed. And actually, the, uh, the citation 
doesn't say much that it just says that I was wounded and in spite of being wounded brought individuals back to the medical bunker continued re treatment for myself that was all true but it doesn't state anything about the fact that if they hadn't been doing that with me uh, carrying me I couldn't have done any of that uh, I would have been uh, out of the battle after my first injury so um, So when he died, there was a lot of guilt, of course, surrounded with that. And it, it, took me, it took me a long time to try to reconcile all that and come to terms with being awarded the Medal of Honor um, and actually dealing with the guilt that I had from, uh, from his sacrifice for me. Plus, there's always a lot of a guilt and unworthiness that... Uh, that I'm sure David Bellavia felt. It's the same kind of thing that we all feel once the president puts that medal around our neck because we just say, why me? You know, I, I only did what I was trained to do, which is what I did. I did what I was trained to do. I did what I was supposed to do. Um, I did what any other uh, soldier, American or mountain yard would have done for me. And I only did what one mountain yard did for me. And he gave his life. Uh, so uh, it took me a long time to try to find a, a place for that medal in my life, what it meant to me, and then how to resolve that with the guilt um, that I felt uh, for the sacrifice of Dale and for the sacrifice of so many that died when I didn't die. And the way I did it was I finally was able to work through that guilt and grab hold of the love once again, that we had for each other. And finding that love and being able to experience that has really helped me deal with that whole traumatic uh, experience of the war. Um, that's the short version. Mm. Have you maintained contact with his family at all? No, they, um, I'm only in contact with one mountain yard that, that we served with and he's an interp he was our interpreter. He was 14, and he now lives in Anchorage, Alaska. I got a phone call from him. I got a message, and um, the message said, hello, my name's Bray. I look for Boxy Bikirk, which Boxy is Vietnamese for doctor. He said, I look for Boxy Bikirk. I uh, just want to let him know I made it out alive because I was medevaced early, and the siege lasted for another uh, 30 days. And uh, Bray had spent all these years just trying to find me, and he now lives in Anchorage, Alaska. He, he, got, meta he got evacuated from S Saigon April 28th, bef two days before it fell. Uh, a special forces captain that he was working with had got him out of the country. He made it to Thailand, spent some years in Thailand, then made it to the States, met up with the captain again down in New Orleans, and that captain got him a job with Xerox as a security consultant. And so he spent uh, years working for Xerox and is now retired and lives in Anchorage, Alaska. So we, we communicate probably uh, two or three times a month. And Anchorage is on my bucket list. Uh, I'd love to get up there to see him. You've been traveling a lot recently. Mm. What's been taking you all over? Um, Most recently, um, it's this idea about um, redeeming the time. Uh, I, ret I worked 33 years as a middle school counselor. And the reason that I went to work with middle school kids is because of what Deo did in my life. My belief was is that here was a 15-year-old boy who for some reason, the culture that he was living in, the way he was brought up, but somehow he still had and things inside of him that enabled him to be willing to give his life. He knew about loving others more than self. He knew about caring for others. And that was demonstrated by his, his love and his sacrifice for me. And my belief was that if this 15-year-old boy can do it, maybe that same potential is in all of us. And it's not limited by age. You don't have to wait to be 18 to start caring for somebody. Um, and so I decided I wanted to work with young people. So I spent 33 years as a middle school counselor 
staying with those sixth, seventh, and eighth graders because they were so challenging, because every day was different with them. Every day was an experience. Um, their enthusiasm, their genuineness, their sponta spontaneity was contagious, and, and I loved it. So after retiring, I decided I wanted to, to continue working with young people. And our Medal of Honor Society has a character development program in which we try to instill certain values in young people, like courage, sacrifice, integrity, citizenship, patriotism. And so I, my plan was to go and uh, travel with the Medal of Honor Society across the country, uh, helping teachers implement that program in their classrooms. Uh, shortly after retiring, a, a year after I retired, I was diagnosed with colon cancer, stage three colon cancer. And it, that was a, another tough, tough battle. Almost died a couple times. And um, although now I am uh, healthy enough, strong enough, and able to travel again. So what's motivating me to travel is the idea of just redeeming this time, you know. Um, Sharing this, sharing the story of, of what the Medal of Honor means, sharing the story of Deo. Um, when I travel, whether it's to a school or churches, community events. Just last week, I spoke at a moral injury symposium down in D.C. It was sponsored by Special Operations, and it was regarding. Um, this new idea that along with PTSD, what might be impacting soldiers and those that um, are returning from war, that might be a part of why the suicide rate is going is, is as crazy as it is. It may not just be that it's PTSD, but there's something more involved with PTSD, PTSD and it's what they're trying to decide and define as moral injury. It's, it's an injury to a person, who they are, what they believe, uh, which makes common sense. And it's something that those of us from the, from the early Vietnam era, we've been saying this for years, is that war changes us. And now they're just starting to come up with scientific research that's verifying the fact that um, not only are you changed organically and physiologically, but emotionally and spiritually as well. That's what war does. So I, I, whether I'm speaking down there at, at those, and I was really out of it, my comfort zone with them because these are all PhDs and, and everything. And here I am with just with my little personal experience. But it was, it was very enlightening. But whether I do that or schools, veterans organizations, um, I try to share about uh, what the Medal of Honor means to me. And, um, it took me a long time uh, after the war. I'm not sure if you're familiar, but many people are that I spent two years living in a cave trying to deal with the war and trying to deal with what the Medal of Honor means. And I've, after that two years, and I'm still learning this, I've learned that what the Medal of Honor means and the honor that comes with that Medal of Honor is that it's nothing about me. Um, all of those who wear the Medal of Honor First thing we would say that this is not about me. I only did what I trained to do. But the honor that comes with this Medal of Honor is that it represents something greater than one person who did one act on one day. It represents millions of men and women who serve every day sacrificially. It represents their families who give because they care for something more than themselves. It represents a different way to live your life, loving others more than yourself. And so that's the message that I and, and many of the recipients who are able to travel share whenever we go. Uh, I also um, share my story of, of Deo and the impact that, that his sacrifice had on me as a, a real illustration of living your life believing that there's something more important than self uh, because Deo lived that right up to the end. You had mentioned a couple minutes ago that war changes the way you believe in things, perhaps the way you look at life. How did that happen for you? Um, I say that the, the war, Vietnam, injured me physically. 
but it was my homecoming that destroyed me. Um, war does change all of us. War, the, the things we believe in, the things that we think are right, the things that we think are moral, are challenged by war. Um, but when you return from war, hopefully you have the experience of finding something that I call like a, a national absolution. Much like when the World War II guys came home and the country welcomes you home and that welcoming, that experience of the love of your country because you're doing something for them, that helps you deal with the hurt and the pain and helps you, even though your values, your morals were tested and challenged, that absolution from your countrymen, that absolution from those that you were protecting makes it worthwhile, it helps you deal with the hurt and the guilt that you feel. Those of us that came back from Vietnam didn't receive that. Um, I was back on a college campus for only oh, less than a week before I got spit on the first time. Rather than getting some kind of a national absolution that helped me deal with the hurt of the war and helped me be able to process everything I experienced and try to integrate that into who I was. I re most of us that came back, or a lot of us that came back received condemnation and the guilt was just heaped on us. And not only the guilt, but the experience of shame. And so many of us hid the fact that we were veterans. Many of us turned to drugs, alcohol, to just to just deal with that pain. Um, I actually went to live in a cave because that was for me, I didn't turn to drugs or alcohol, but my, my feelings were that if I could just get into this cave, um, it'll be safe and then I'll work on trying to forget because my belief was that if I could just forget about it all, it wouldn't, wouldn't bother me anymore. If, and if I just don't care about anything else, if I hold nothing of value to me, then nobody can hurt me. If I don't care about people, don't care about things, don't care about life, nobody can hurt those feelings. So that's what I, I shut down everything and went and hid in a cave. Um, and, but what I learned was that forgetting is not getting better. Um, and one of my students once asked me, he said, hey, Mr. B, you know, it sounded like you had a really great time in that cave, because I did. I lived up in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Uh, it was beautiful country up there. And he said, it sounds like you really liked it. What brought you out of the cave? And I t told him, I said, well, in this small little town, Lancaster, New Hampshire, there was this pretty young blonde girl. I got to know her, fell in love with her, asked her to marry me. And she said, okay, but only if you come out of the cave. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we've been married for 44 years. Um, that love brought me out of the cave. Uh, I found out that forgetting isn't getting better. F getting better is finding someone who's willing to come into the cave with you, who's willing to be with you and to hear your hurt, to share your hurt, just to listen. There's no way that my wife could understand what I experienced, but I didn't need understanding. I just needed somebody to listen and to give me the experience that they cared, that they hurt with me, that they were um, sorry that I had to go through that. Um, that's what brought me out of the cave. Uh, she brought love into my life. But then another important part of that, which is uh, even more important than the love my wife brought, is that uh, I had taken a Bible into the cave with me and uh, I had an experience of of finding a God who loved me, a God who forgave me. And working with him in my relationship, uh, he's the one really that enabled me to live life outside of the cave. And my faith became a very, very important part of my life. And it still is today. It still is today, yep. Um, and that's why I say that uh, when people say, why, you know, what does it mean to you to wear the Medal of Honor? I wear it for all those men and women who serve. I wear it as a way of sharing a message that there's a different way to live your life and that it's bigger than one person who does any one thing on any one day. But more importantly for me, whenever I wear it, 
I always try to share that I wear it for God's honor because it was only because of God's grace that I survived Vietnam. If, you know, without his grace, I, I, I should have been dead. And it's only because of his grace that I'm able to live outside the cave um, because I found his forgiveness, I found his grace, and find, found out um, what it meant to have God be a part of your life every day and that he had a plan for me. It was, it was interesting. Um, not too many people know this, but when I went into the cave, I made a prayer. Uh, I said, God, you gave me my life back in Vietnam. It's only because of you I survived. Now I give, I'll give my life back to you, God, whatever you want from my life, whatever you want, because I've made a mess of it. Here I am living in a cave. It's not a very good life, but I give it back to you. I made that prayer in September of 73. Two weeks later, I was notified I was being given the Medal of Honor. Two weeks after, I said, God, whatever you want. And so that's the other reason that I say I work for his honor, because I felt that with that, he was just saying, Gary, I've got a plan for you. I want you to come out of the cave. I want you to share about what it means to love others more than yourself. I want you to share with others what it means um, to be able to have the grace of God in your life. And so that's what I've been doing for since 1975 when I came out of the cave. You said you went to the middle school yeah. thinking that if Deo could do what he did at 15 that there would be that essential fortitude in other kids his age. Mm -hmm. Did you find that to be the truth? Oh yeah. I've. Uh, uh, that, along with many other lessons, uh, they taught me, young people taught me that not only did they have the ability to care for others, but they taught me um, hope. They gave me hope. Um, I'm often asked, what's the most important lesson that I think that I've learned? And I think about this one particular student who I had a background on because I had her older sister. And when she, the older sister left, she said, Mr. B, my, daughter, my sister's coming in and she's going to be a hard one. And so whenever I, when I met her sister as a sixth grader, as soon as she saw me, she knew the history and so she walked away. She said, I don't want anything to do with you. Leave me alone. And she was just, you know, you talk about walls and caves that we go into. Young people can go into a cave just as easily and they can build up walls that are much stronger than the granite walls of Mount Washington. Um, this girl had walls built because of the things that had happened to her. I always would walk up to her, what I call knocking on her door, just let her know that I was there. That happened sixth, seventh, and eighth grade, and, and most of the time she'd just give me a one-finger gesture and walk away uh, if I was lucky. Other yeah. times there was a barrage of, <laughs> of expletives that would be accompany that one-finger gesture. But I saw her in eighth grade when she left, and I said, if there's ever a time you want to talk, I want to be able to, I want you to let, let you know that I'll be there for you. One night about midnight, I got a phone call and I said hello and she said, Mr. B, you know, she said, you once told me that you'd talk. Can we talk now? And I said, sure. So we met at the Wegmans on the corner up there at 12 o'clock at night and had a cup of coffee. She was 23 years old. See, it may not always be easy, but I believe that people can change. And it was things like that that brought me in every morning and trying to make a difference in the, the life of the young people there. Um, I maintain a Facebook page, and one of the reasons I do it is to keep track of, uh, to allow a, a, a way for the former students to be in touch with me. I have over 500 former students now who are in the military. Through all the years, over 500 of them are in the military all over the world. And uh, again, today I just got another uh, message from someone who's serving there in Korea. And they say, hey, Mr. B, just want to let you know where I am. I um, want to let you know I, I often remember the stories you told me uh, and just want to thank you. Um, so yeah, I, I've. There was a time when I, I felt that not being able to stay in Special Forces was a, a loose end. It was like a, a, 
a real hurt loose end because that was my career, that was my niche. I was a Green Beret professional and to not be able to stay there because of my wounds, I had to get out of the military because of my wounds, to not be able to finish that was a, um, a real disappointment. But looking back on it, uh, and again, this is all part of God's plan, I think, he had, a, he had another plan. Gary, I got something better for you to do than being in the military. Here's a group of people I want you to work with, young people. Stay with them, Gary. And I had 33 years of working with them. And I could tell you story after story of, of individuals that um, were changed because not for anything that, any special wisdom or any kind of gift that I had other than just I loved them. Uh, I cared for them. And um, that was one of the things that they always knew is that, you know, we always knew that you, you were genuine, that you cared for us. Because not only did you care for all the cool kids, but you cared for the kids that were looked down upon too. It didn't, you didn't treat any of us any different. And love doesn't do that. It doesn't, it's not a respecter of persons. So yeah, my time in the, mili in the military was critical and it's still a very passionate part of who I am. But my time with young people uh, is just as great, if not greater. Um, and, and you ask me, what, why do I continue to do now? What, you know, what is it? It's that passion for, for being able to make a difference in someone else's life. I used to teach life lessons to the students, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade a series of life lessons that would help them. Certain series for sixth graders, one for uh, other lessons for seventh graders, and then eighth graders. And one of the life lessons that I taught to them was that, um, came from a saying that we had in Vietnam that to truly live, to really live, you must almost die. To those that fight for it, life will have a meaning the protected will never know. And the first time I taught that to a seventh grader, his name was Eric. He said, you mean I got to almost die to really live, Mr. B? That's pretty, pretty heavy, isn't it? I said, well, I'm not talking about dying physically, Eric, but maybe you do have to die, die to yourself to really live, practice dying to yourself, denying yourself, realize that there's something greater, realize that maybe you can make a difference in someone else's life by helping them. To those that fight for it, Eric, life will have a meaning the protective will never know. And he said, so I should go out in the hall and start a fight, only to you know, fight for myself? And I said, no, I'm talking about fighting because the real battles are fought and they're won or lost in your heart and in your mind. Whenever I fought a battle in Vietnam, it wasn't out here. I had to first of all fight it here and here and say, what am I trained to do? What's my motivation? And you fight that battle here and in here. And the weapons that you use are the weapons of caring for others, loving others, the values that you have for them. And I'm trying to teach those values, those weapons, so that students will be able to fight in their heart and in their mind. And when the battle comes up, they'll make the right choice. Because those who fight for it, rather than those who stay safe, who stay in their comfort zone, who choose not to risk, they'll never know um, the meaning that those who do fight have, to, that those who die to themselves have. And then the other the important lesson was is that, and I really thought about this when I was dying of cancer this last time, that in life there's a big difference between success and significance. Mm -hmm. And I, I tell the students that I've had a lot of successes in life, but when I was dying with cancer, I didn't think about all those successes. What I thought about were significant moments. Significant moments like meeting that student at midnight at Wegmans. There's a big difference between success and significance. And when it comes down to the end, what's going to matter are those moments of significance. And significance will happen when you realize that there's a different way to live your life, that you can make a difference in others' lives. Those will be the things that as you grow older will really provide meaning to your life. Success is great, but significance is greater.